Sometimes it's just good to just sit in his presence or stand in his presence and just be amazed at his goodness. Heavenly Father, we do welcome your presence here today. We thank you, Lord, that you are right here in the midst of us, making your presence known to each one of us. And we invite you to confirm your word with signs following. We invite you to manifest your presence in any way that you see fit. We just surrender the rest of the service into your hands, Lord. We ask you to have your way. I ask for your anointing on the message and help me to speak what you want me to speak, nothing of the flesh but only by your spirit. We invite you to speak through me, your will and your wisdom, and help each person to receive what you intend for them to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for your help. Next time we'll turn her mic way up and my mic way down. See how that goes. Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing today? Hallelujah. Well, on, on Sunday mornings, I, I said for the next few Sundays, maybe, maybe for the next several Sundays, I want to share 
with you what I believe the Bible says the church should look like. And last, last, I guess it was two weeks ago, I shared the fact that the church is God's idea. It's not man's idea. It's God's idea. And so that's something that we need to be aware of. But today I want to share with you Well, let me ask you a question. Who are you? Do you know who you are? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's cheating. Let me go back. Where's the Where's the logo? Okay. All right. All right. Who are you? Do you know who you are? A believer? That's a good answer. How, how do you define yourself? God's child? That's a good answer. I want, you to, I want to share with you today that not just the believer part, but the priesthood part. The priesthood of all believers. You are a priest. Did you know you're a priest? How many priests are in this room? Every hand should go up. You are a priest. A priest, you know, a, a lot of traditional denominations have distorted the meaning of the word priest. And I want to share with you today, I want to share with you today from Scripture, I want you to see that you are a priest, and you need to understand what a priest is. But I also want to share with you that you are a temple. I mentioned this last time, that you are the house of God. The Scripture also says you're the temple. So we, we not only have a a room full of priests, we have a room full of temples. That's you. And, you know, under the Old Covenant, there were a select few priests. There were, you had to be, in order to be a priest, you had to be born in the right family. You had to be born in the right tribe and in the right, um, the right lineage within that tribe. And you also had to be a man. There were no women priests in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it says in Christ there's neither male nor female. Every believer is a priest. And what that really means is, you know, a lot of, I don't want to pick on any specific denomination, but there are certain groups of Christians that have maintained an old covenant priesthood, kind of, where you have to go to a certain man in order to get your sins forgiven. There's a, a, a man between you and and God, and you have to go through them to get your sins forgiven. But that's unbiblical. You can go, as a priest of the new covenant, you can go directly to God. You have direct access to God. So you don't need somebody between you and God. See, I, there have been a couple of times when the subject came up. I didn't purposely introduce the subject, but in a general casual conversation, meeting somebody, and they find out that I'm a pastor, and one person this happened at least twice. They say, oh, so you're a priest. And don't, don't really know how to answer that. Yes, I am a priest, but not because I'm a pastor. I'm a priest because I'm a child of God. You know, so there, a lot of people, a lot of the religious world have a misunderstanding of what a priest is. They have a misunderstanding of what it means to be a priest. So um, I, I remember one person saying, I thought that you were a priest. But again, it's a misunderstanding of what the word is. So yes, I, I want to say, yes, I am a priest, but not the kind that you're thinking of. All right, so let's begin. What, what happened was... Why is this thing not cooperating? I guess it needs to wake up or something. I don't know. <laughs> so under the... What happened was, remember... When Jesus was on the cross and the veil was rent, right? When Jesus was dying and the veil of the temple rent uh, was torn in, in half. And that symbolized the ending of the old covenant and symbolizing the end of that old priesthood and the beginning of a new covenant and a new priesthood. And, well, let's, let's read through this and then I want to elaborate a little bit on this. This is really when the New Covenant began. It was actually, I would say the New Covenant actually began when Jesus died on the cross, at least when he rose from the dead. But, the, but 
Um, 50 days later, it, the Holy Spirit came, and this is kind of the ratification of the beginning of that new covenant. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what, what was happening here? Fifty days before this is when the veil was torn. Ending that first covenant, that old covenant. And at this point, this is the day of Pentecost, which we see the day of Pentecost as something that we celebrate as for the Holy Spirit baptism. They received the Holy Spirit baptism. But there's so much more happening here. That's important. But why does it say suddenly? Suddenly there came. There, it, it, there was the speaking in tongues, but there was a lot of other supernatural things happening there. Suddenly there was a sound as a rushing, rushing mighty wind. I've, I've found it interesting for a long time that it doesn't say there was a rushing mighty wind. It says there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. But I kind of think there was a rushing mighty wind because I think what this is, it's showing you the Holy Spirit coming into their lives. The whole, you see, what I'm trying to convey is that a lot of people have the idea that you have to tarry for the Holy Spirit and you have to pray. And it's like it's almost like the Holy Spirit is reluctant to come. You know what I mean? You don't have to tarry. The Holy Spirit's not reluctant. When he found these available people, he came suddenly. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, he comes suddenly. And I would say if you invited him in, whether you felt him or not, he came in suddenly. He is there. He came as a rushing mighty wind. What happens here, I believe, is... The Holy Spirit, the presence, the presence of God left that old temple. Again, that's symbolized by the, the veil that was torn. The Holy Spirit, the presence of God left that old temple. The presence of God was no longer under that old system or within that old system. And he came rushing into these new temples. There was 120 people there, not just men, but men and women. And these were new temples. Okay? Do you understand? He left the old temple, and now he comes rushing into 120 new temples. And each of you are a temple of God, and he wants to rush into your life also if you, if you make him available. Okay? So he's, he, this happened suddenly, and he came rushing in, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And it says that they, their, their fire appeared above their heads, apparently, and... Plus, they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And this, this marked the beginning of the priesthood of all believers. Every believer was a priest. Now, this isn't a for, it may be a foreign concept to some of you. I don't know, but it, it wasn't, it's not a foreign concept to most Protestants. Martin Luther preached the priesthood of all believers. Martin Luther believed that. Most of the reformers, the early reformers, believed in the priesthood of all believers. I believe Peter, James, and John, and, and, and Paul all preached the priesthood of all believers. The new, the new covenant priest is far different than the old covenant priest. Again, it's not just a select few. Under the old covenant, only a select few people could experience the presence of God. There were the priests, but there were also the judges, the prophets, and the kings that would occasionally experience the presence of God, and the high priest, when he went into the Holy of Holies, would experience the, the, the presence of God. But it, it's just those select few. Most people could not experience the fullness of the presence of God under the Old Covenant, but under the New Covenant, we can. You can experience, and not just once in a while, but you can live on an ongoing basis in the presence of God. The presence, of, the presence of God within you as the temple of God and upon you as a priest of God. And it's not a difficult thing. Under the old covenant, the priesthood w um, involved a lot of work. And I think under most, in most, under, 
in the mindset of most Christians, being a believer is a lot of work. I remember one time at, at the school that I was teaching at, one of, the, uh, one of the students telling me that I want to live as a Christian, but it's so hard. Do you, have you ever felt that way before? <laughs> it's so hard to live a Christian life. Well, if you try to live it under your own efforts, it's going to be hard. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Amen. One verse that, I'm, that I've shared a lot with you guys, because I really love this verse, Philippians 2.13, it's God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God working in you. As if you're trying to live the Christian life under your own effort, it's going to be difficult. But when you realize that it's not me, it's God working in me, both to will and to do what I'm supposed to do. That makes it effortless. It's his effort, not mine. He does all the effort. My, my part is simply to yield to him. My part is simply to learn to rest. My part is to allow him to do what he wants to do in me and through me. Isn't this an awesome verse? Have you ever meditated on that verse? It's God working in you. He's doing, he's doing the work. There's another scripture. Well, I won't mention the other scripture. I think, it's, I think there's another scripture similar to that down the line here. But you need to see yourself as a priest. And what that means is you don't need to go to somebody else to confess your sins. You don't need to go to somebody else and have them pray on your behalf. Now, it's okay if you want somebody to pray for you, that's fine. But what I'm trying to convey to you, and one thing I've tried to convey repeatedly, is that you have direct access to God. You don't need to go through me or through anybody else. You don't need, sure, invite, ask people to pray, to pray for you, that's fine. But you have direct access to the throne of God. As a priest of God, you have direct access. Amen. The scripture says we have one mediator. There's one mediator between God and man, and that's Christ Jesus. Not the Holy Father of the so-and-so church. <laughs> but you have one mediator. That's Jesus. Amen. So you're a priest, and he's your high priest. Another scripture, John said something similar in 1 John 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we have a mediator. He's here, here he's called the advocate. So whatever you're going through in life, you have one person to take it to, and that's Jesus. Because he, he cares for you more than anybody. He loves you more than anybody. And he wants to take care of those issues, whatever they are. And, and if you sin, John doesn't say if you sin, you need to repent and you need to change your ways and you need to clean up your act. No, he says we have an advocate. If you do sin, it's not the end of the world. I'm not certainly not advocating sin. But he's saying if you sin, just go to Jesus. Go to the Father through Jesus. Jesus the righteous. He imputes his righteousness into you. Praise God. God is so awesome. All the time. <laughs> Amen. All right, so let's look at, uh, let's go back to Acts, Acts 2. Now, so in, in Acts 2, what happened is, let me explain what, what happened between those, that verse 4 and verse 17. People start speaking in tongues, and it's not just, random speaking in tongues, they were speaking, the, the crowd gathered around and they heard the gospel being preached in their own language by these Galileans, these seemingly uneducated Galileans were preaching languages that they've never heard, They're, they never learned. Because so, that was the season of Pentecost and there were people in Jerusalem from all around, from all over the, the empire really, Coming, Jews coming to, Pentecost, to, to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. So there were these people from various cultures around, different parts of the empire, 
that, that were in Jerusalem, and suddenly they started hearing the gospel being preached in their language. So a, ga a, a crowd gathered around that upper room, and then Peter starts preaching. So people start thinking, well, these guys are drunk, <laughs> and Peter says, they're not drunk like you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. And then he starts preaching, and this is part of the sermon that he preaches. This is the first sermon of the church, the first sermon of the New Covenant, right here in Acts chapter 2, preached by Peter. And he says, he, he quotes a little bit from, uh, from the book of Joel. He says, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So there's a few things. This is, again, Peter is quoting from the book of Joel. This was prophesied by Joel. And I suspect Joel probably didn't really have much of a clue as far as what he was talking about. <laughs> Joel, Joel, Joel had prophesied this, but I'm sure he wasn't really aware of what he was saying. Because the idea of the spirit coming upon all flesh, that had to have been a very strange thought to an average Old Covenant believer. Because again, only the prophets, priests, and kings, and the judges had access at all, it seems, to, to the presence of the Holy Spirit. But now, Joel had prophesied the Holy Spirit's going to come upon all flesh. The Holy Spirit's going to be available for anybody. And also, under the Old Covenant, the priests were only men, right? And only a few select men. Only, again, you had to be part of the right family. But here it says, he'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Do you believe that? I think you should claim this. My sons and my daughters are going to prophesy. <laughs> again, not just my sons, but my sons and my daughters can prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and not just men. I think he's including women here. The young will see vision, the old will dream dreams. Have you had any visions or dreams lately? I'm not going to ask who's, who's had visions and who has had dreams, because that might distinguish whether you're young or old, <laughs> according to this verse. But, and again, my servants and my handmaidens, male and female, it's not just a male thing anymore. Those churches out there that try to restrict women from preaching and, and doing th certain things, that's unbiblical. I know what scriptures they're claiming to use, but they're misinterpreting them. The biblical, especially new, the new covenant principle is all flesh. In Christ, there is neither male nor female. Anybody in Christ, if you're a Christ, you are, if you're in Christ, you are a priest of the new covenant, and you can operate in the things of God, you can preach, you can teach, you can prophesy, you can do anything that any man can do. Praise God. It says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and they shall prophesy. So, so again, under the old covenant, only a limited few people. There, there's a scripture, I probably should have put it up there, but I, I didn't. There's Galatians 3.28, which is a good scripture for you to memorize, where it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for all are one in Christ. A lot of people in the world try to put distinctions between different um, nationalities or, or skin color or, or gender. People try, tend to put up walls between people. There's a tendency among many, even churches, that try to build walls between people. But Paul taught that under the new covenant, there is neither Jew nor Greek. In other words, it doesn't matter what your culture is or what your nationality is or, or anything else. Those walls are torn down. Neither bond nor free, because we're all free in Christ. Neither male nor female. So all are one in Christ. So Christ wants to use you. Again, if you received him as your Lord and Savior, you are a priest of the new covenant. What exactly does that mean? To be a priest means, for one thing, it means you have direct access to God. But what does a priest do? A priest would represent God to the people, but he would also represent the people to God. But you don't need a man 
to represent God to you because you are a priest yourself. You have direct access to him. But being a priest also means that you can intercede on behalf of other people. If other people need, if other people have a need, you can minister to their need. You have the right. You don't need to take somebody to the pastor to pray for them. You can pray for them. You have just as much access to God as the pastor does. Perhaps not all pastors will tell you that, but it's true. You have just as much access. You are just as much of a priest as I am. Can I hear you say, I'm a priest? I'm a priest. Convince me. <laughs> say, I'm a, I'm a priest. Okay, so you have direct access to God. You don't need to go through me or through anybody else. You can contact him. You can connect with him. Again, I'm willing to pray for anybody, but I'm just telling you, you can go directly to God. You have that ability. Praise God. Let's skip. This is a long sermon. It took up most of the chapter. We're going to skip down to verse 32, which is still the same sermon. And Peter says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being at the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which you now see and hear. So what Peter was saying is what you are witnessing, all these supernatural things that they are witnessing, again, the rushing mighty wind, the, the, the fire, the preaching the gospel in all these different languages. He's saying all these things that you're seeing and hearing, this is proof of the resurrection. And he's saying this is, these are things that Jesus said was going to happen. And this, he had already said this is the ful fulfillment of what Joel prophesied, but now he's saying that this is proof of the resurrection. And skipping down to verse 38, then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and unto your children and unto all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So the, what Peter says in verse 38 is he says repent. This is another one of those words that a lot of people misunderstand what the word repent means. A lot of people think that repent means um, feeling sorry for your sins and, and basically coming to the altar and crying and that type of thing. That's not necessarily repentance. The word repent just simply means to change your mind. If you look up the Greek word, it just simply means to change your mind or change the way you think. Okay, you were going one way, you change your mind, and now you're going the other way. You used to think that, that the way to salvation was through works, through, through doing certain things, maybe through obeying the Ten Commandments. To repent is to realize that now the way to God is by grace through faith. Not through the works that you did. It's through the works Jesus did on your behalf. So G Peter was preaching repentance because these are the people that crucified Jesus. At least among the crowd, there were people there that had crucified Jesus. And he's telling them, repent, because you got it wrong. You need to change the way you think. This guy that you crucified truly is the Messiah. And what you're witnessing today is proof that he is resurrected. So he's trying to get them to change the way they think. And he's, he's saying that if you repent and turn to Jesus you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he said, this promise, what promise? The promise of the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Ghost is for you. It's for you. No matter who you are, this promise is available to you. So again, it's the priesthood of all believers. Anybody who receives him can have him as their savior. Anybody can be a priest of the new covenant. So he says, this promise is to you. No qualifying it's for you. All you have to do is believe it. Believe it and receive it. It's available to you. It's for your children. And it's, and we need, as parents, we need to claim this for our children. There's another scripture in, I think it's Acts 16, where it says that, that uh, believe upon the Lord and you'll be saved and your household. You know, we need to claim these promises. Believe that our children are saved. Believe that our grandchildren are saved. And, and just claim these things. Believe them. Again, 
as a priest, you have direct access to God. You can take these issues directly to God. You can take your children to the throne of God and your grandchildren. It's, so it's, it's available to you. It's available to your children. It's available to all that are far off. The word all is pretty inclusive, right? Because there there's a lot of people that say that only, only God only allows, it's called Calvinism, only certain people are allowed to be saved. God, God has chosen certain people to be saved. But there's so many scriptures that, that make it clear that salvation is available to anybody who will receive it. Each of us are called to live in his presence. Each of us are called to take Jesus to the nations. Okay, so Peter concludes his sermon after this, and then in the very next chapter, we see, we see Peter and John going to the temple. These are good Jewish men, and they went to the temple to pray. And as they were approaching the temple, there, there was a lame man. You guys know this story, I'm sure. There was a lame man. That, that it says he was there for 38 years. He was 38 years old. He was lame since birth, and he had been begging at the temple, at the temple gate, all his life. And no doubt Jesus had seen him, but I assume Jesus had seen him there previously, but, but this man is still there begging for money. So Peter says to him, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and, and ankle bones received strength. And leaping up, stood and walked and entered with, with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Isn't that an awesome thing? So Peter, Peter and, and John understood the authority that had been given to them as priests of the new covenant. They understood the authority that had been given to them by Jesus in the Great Commission, which I'm going to look at that in a minute. But they had power and they had authority. What I want you to see is you have just as much power and authority as Peter and John did. This wasn't exclusive just to the apostles. You are just as much of a priest of the new covenant as Peter and John are or were. You have power. You have power. You know, they, they notice that they didn't say, young man, let me pray for you. <laughs> they didn't say, well, let's pray about this. Let's, let's see what God has to say about this. Let's pray about it. But no, they, they spoke. I talked about this in the past about, I call it the prayer of declaration, where it says, um, pray for the sick and they shall be healed. It's talking about a prayer of declaration. In other words, not a prayer in the sense of asking God, please heal this person, but it's speaking with authority what God says he already did. So he, he says, notice Peter, Peter says, silver and gold have I none. He's not saying I'm broke. I don't think he's saying that at all. I'm think, I, I don't think he was broke. I think what he's saying is I don't have any cash on me right now. <laughs> have, have you ever been there? You, you know, you, it's not that I don't have money. I just don't have it with me. So I don't, I don't think Peter and John were, were poor by any means. But anyway, he says, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I'll give to you. So this man is there begging for money, and he holds out his hand expecting to receive alms, some money. But instead, he says, I don't have that with me, but what I do have, I'll give to you in the name of Jesus Rise up and walk. So he doesn't say, Lord, please heal this person. He just speaks to the body and he commands it to be healed. That's how we minister healing. That's how we minister in the power and the authority of, of Christ, by speaking with authority what he says he already did. When he went to the cross, by his stripes you are healed. And it also says there that he became poor so, so that you would be rich. He took care of whatever your needs are. He took care of them. 2,000 years ago when he went to the cross, Peter and John understood that, so they spoke with authority. And what I'm trying to convey to you today is you have the exact same power within you. If you have Jesus, how many of you have Jesus? You have the exact same power that Peter and John had. And you have the exact same authority. 
So even when the devil attacks your body, don't, don't acknowledge the symptoms that, he, that the devil is trying to put on, on you. Acknowledge what Jesus paid for. Acknowledge the, the healing, the health, the wholeness that, that he died and paid for on your behalf and expect that to manifest. You are a priest. You are a priest of the new covenant. Let me skip. Okay, so, oh yes, this, this is what I wanted to share with you. This is the Great Commission. The Great Commission was not just for the 12 apostles. The Great Commission is for all followers of Jesus. Amen? And, and Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. So I find it interesting that Jesus is saying he has all power and all authority in heaven. All power and authority has been placed within Jesus, but then Jesus says, you go in my authority. He's saying, I have the authority, now I'm giving it to you. I have the power, I have the authority, now your responsibility is to go in his name. So he, he's not here in, in, you know, in his flesh. He's here in your flesh. <laughs> Jesus is still here, but he's here in you. And you are his priest. You are his representative. So you are to operate in his power and in his authority. Jesus also said in John 14 that he was sending you the Holy Spirit. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. We need to believe that. That you can do the same works Jesus did, and greater. I mean, Jesus said that. Jesus didn't lie to us, right? So he said, you can do the same works he did, and greater works, because I go to the Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name. So it's all in his name. You need to believe in the authority and in the power of his name. To do something in his name means to do something as his representative. You are a representative of Jesus on earth. And for you to minister to people, and you have the ability to minister to people. Again, don't just take, if you, if you take the, your issues to the pastor, that's fine, the pastor wants to pray for you, but I'm just telling you, you have direct access to God himself. You don't have to go through a person. You can go directly to God. Whatsoever you ask in my name, just ask it. Whatever you're asking him for, ask it. Ask for it in the name of Jesus. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Isn't that an awesome promise? I mean, it doesn't get better than that. This is almost like I did a, a sermon a few years ago that I called, I think I called it like the blank check or something like that. There are a lot of scriptures like this where he just kind of, it's kind of like a blank check. He says, whatever you ask, ask in my name, I'll do it. That the Father may be glorified. There's a lot of scriptures like this. I think there's at least seven or eight scriptures that are, that are very similar to this. So you have power. How many of you believe you have power? Put those hands up, you guys. You don't believe this? I'm not the one promising this. It's Jesus promising you this. How many of you believe you have authority? <laughs> I hope your hands are up online. You have power. You have authority. Speak to yourself. Speak to your body. But if, if, if you come across people, you know, ask God to, to use you throughout the week. And God will bring people across your path that need prayer or they have a need of some kind. And take it upon yourself to minister to them. Because, again, you are a priest of the new covenant. It comes right out and tells us this in two places in the book of Revelation. It says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So it says he has made us kings and priests. Some translations say a kingdom of priests. About, it seems like about half the translations translate this a kingdom of priests and the other half kings and priests. But either way, it's correct. So you are a king, you are a priest. The word amen simply means so be it or it is so. It kind of reaffirms this as, 
as truth. Truth that God is, is imparting into you. That you are a king of the new covenant and you are a priest of the new covenant. And it repeats almost word for word in chapter 5. It says, and hath made us unto God, our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. We shall reign on earth. And I don't think this is talking, in fact, I know this isn't talking about something in the future. It's talking about now, in this lifetime. We are to reign on earth now in this lifetime. Do you believe that? He wants us to reign. He wants us to, to operate in his authority. One, thing, one reason why the devil is so scared is because we, we know that Jesus defeated the devil, but now there's not just one Jesus that he has to deal with. There's millions of Jesuses. The problem is most Christians don't know that. Most Christians don't understand that they are a priest of the new covenant. Most Christians don't realize that they are priests and kings on earth. Most people don't realize that they are little Jesuses. <laughs> you know, we, we are to manifest his presence wherever we go. But we need to have an expectation of that. It's, it's one thing to know this in our head, but we need to have an expectation of, of him manifesting himself through us. Uh, another scripture in 1 Peter 2, 1, But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is, this, this is something that should be transformative, I think, in, in our lives, if we really understand what Peter is saying here. So being a priest of the new covenant isn't a chore. It's a delight. It should be a joy. It's a joy to serve. You know, I, I know a lot of times people struggle to, to get to church or to do, to do things that they believe God wants them to do, but it shouldn't be a chore to go to church. It should be a joy. It's a joy to serve, especially if you're serving in some capacity, and, and I believe Christians should be serving, but if you're serving in some capacity, it should be a joy to serve. So let's, let's take a look at this a little bit closer. First of all, Peter says, but ye, in other words, you. This is a promise for you. And it says, you are a chosen generation. This generation, ever since the cross, that generation and every generation since then is a chosen generation. God has chosen this generation to manifest his life, to manifest his marvelous light. He says, you are a chosen generation, that's us, that's, that means you and me. Don't, don't have an expectation of this being for some future generation. This is for our generation. A royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. Not only are we a priesthood, we are a royal priesthood. The word royal implies royalty or kingship. So again, kings and priests. We are kings and priests. A royal priesthood. And holy nation. Christians are members of the family of God and the kingdom of God. And so I sometimes say I have dual citizenship. I, I'm, I have, I'm a citizen of that holy nation that he's talking about and, of course, the U.S., but my primary allegiance is to that holy nation, <laughs> the kingdom of God. And here's something that sometimes people find strange is he calls you a peculiar people. Has anyone ever called you peculiar? Nobody? <laughs> but the word peculiar, and in fact it might be translated this way in other translations, it really means unique. What he's really saying is you are a unique people. He's not really saying you're strange. He's saying you're unique. Christians are a unique people that we should show forth his praises. So one, one thing that, he, that we do as Christians is we show forth the praises of him who has called us. Christians love to praise the Lord, don't we? Most Christians do anyway. So, so we want to show forth his praises. 
He's called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Okay, one last verse. To whom God, whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So, again, each one of us are equally in ministry. You know, I, I see myself as a minister of the gospel, but I don't think I'm any more of a minister of the gospel than any of you. Each of us are equally called into ministry. My function in ministry may be different than yours, but you're called into ministry just as much as I am because we're all priests of the new covenant and uh, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. If you believe that Christ is in you, if you believe you have the Holy Spirit within you, that should impact your life. It should impact your lifestyle. It should impact how you interact with people. It should, it should have a major impact on how you live. And it says, so Christ in you, that's what our, our message is, Got Christ in you. You can have Christ living within you, the hope of glory, whom we preach. What does he mean by warning every man and teaching every man? I don't think, I, I think a large part of what Paul and Peter, especially Paul, were preaching, especially among the Jews, is warning them that their legalistic lifestyle isn't getting them, them anywhere. We need to warn people that legalism kills and warn people, it says, teach every man in all wisdom. We need to teach people about grace and teach people about the gift of righteousness. Teach people in all wisdom that the way to access God is not through our self-effort, but through his effort, what he did on our behalf. That's, that's a mistake that many people make. They put a lot of effort into trying to please God, and it's never going to work. You're never going to be able to please God through your own effort. Jesus please God on your behalf through his effort. And then he just gives us the free gift of righteousness. So it says presenting every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Your perfection does not come through your self-effort. Your perfection comes through Jesus' effort. He presents you perfect in Christ. So it says striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So again, it's him working mightily in me. It's not anything that I've done. It's not anything that I have perfected in myself. It's what he has perfected in me. He works in me, again, to will and to do of his good pleasure. So I, I'm going to skip that one in Zechariah. The one in Zechariah just simply says, not by might, not by power, but by the, the spirit of the Lord. In other words, it's not well, maybe I'll look at it anyway. I was going to. Okay. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, and saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, not by your might, not by your power, but by the spirit of the Lord. You will never perfect yourself, so there's no point trying. <laughs> he wants to do the work, because he already did the work. He did it in Christ Jesus. So whatever you're trying to accomplish by your might and by your power is almost pointless because he's saying it's by his spirit that he wants to perfect you. By his spirit, he wants to minister through you. By his spirit, he wants to accomplish whatever it is he wants to accomplish in your life by his spirit. So let's, let's have communion. And... I'm going to look at 1 Corinthians 11. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night 
in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we need to understand that when Jesus went to the cross, remember I mentioned that veil was torn, indicating that that old covenant, that old way, that old religious life, <laughs> that old pattern was finished. There are a lot of churches today that still try to live under that old covenant priesthood, but it's finished. Jesus is your high priest. Jesus lived the righteous life that you couldn't live, and he took the punishment upon himself on our behalf. And he is our high priest, and he makes you a priest. Hallelujah. So if you would stand with the wafer. And repeat after me, if you would. Jesus took all my sickness, pain, and disease. He heals my body completely. Jesus took all my confusion and mental issues. He heals my mind completely. Spirit, soul, and body. Intellect, finances, and relationships are healed and made whole in Jesus' name. Go ahead and partake. And hold the cup. And repeat after me. The blood of Jesus was shed for me. He is the Lord of my life. Jesus took all my sins and mistakes. He gave me the gift of righteousness. God raised Jesus from the dead and has prepared a home for me in heaven. I am a priest of the new covenant. As he is, so am I in this world. Go ahead and partake. Hallelujah. I hope you receive that. I hope you believe it. And I hope you act like it. <laughs> you are a priest. So act like a priest this week. Minister to somebody the gospel. Allow God to use you in some capacity this week. Come on, sister. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are now coming into our um, part in serving the Lord, show our support in his ministry in this world. Um, through the gift of giving, there are four ways to give. With cash in an envelope with your name on it. Uh, with a check made out to Abiding Life. Through PayPal www.abidinglife.net slash donate and with a debit or credit card um, please see the pastor after the service if you want to avail of this way of giving let us pray our loving heavenly father we uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to serve you through giving thank you lord for using us in the ministry through this wonderful gift uh, for blessing us so that we can be a blessing to others and we um Commit everything into your hands, Father. Bless each giver and the gift. And may this be used in the furtherance of your ministry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. Every Thursday, there's a meeting here at 7 p.m. Um, our next one will be on the 23rd. Um, Grace Bible Study led by Marvin Jr. On the 2nd is a prayer meeting. Uh, on the 9th, March 9th, disciples, discipleship class. And on the 16th, uh, James Bible study led by Candy Miller. Don't forget our pot faith fellowship meal. It's on the 26th. That's next Sunday, this coming Sunday, after our church service. Uh, please um, let Claire know 
or <laughs> if you know what what kind of dish you wanna uh, bring uh, dessert um, main dish or appetizers and we wish that you will all be here to join us and that can, that's going to be a very nice fellowship for everybody there's a single faith potluck and board games on saturday march 11th at 6 p.m uh, all the single gentlemen and ladies we invite you to come and um, meet uh, other single ladies or gentlemen in the area or whatever, wherever they come from. There's going to be board games and potluck and um, lots of fellowship. Our first healing service of 2023 uh, will be um, by Chad Gonzalez. He is a Rama graduate and member of ARMI. That will be on Saturday, March 25th, and Sunday on March 26th. March 25th will be at 7 p.m., and then Sunday, March 26th, will be our um, regular service at 11 a.m. Um, we hope that you can come. That's all. Um, if you haven't done so, please connect with us through uh, YouTube, and you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Let us all stand for the benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May the Lord be with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.